Welcome to Life After Corporate, your ultimate guide for making the leap from corporate leader to entrepreneur. I'm Deb Boulanger, entrepreneur, executive leader, and founder of the Launch Lab for Women Entrepreneurs. This is your time to break through the glass ceiling once and for all and get your ticket to the C-suite. Come back each week to get the leading strategies, advice, and tools that will give you the skills and confidence you need to replace your corporate paycheck. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome, everyone. This is Deb Boulanger with Episode 5 of Life After Corporate. The top three mistakes that new entrepreneurs make when they're first starting out. And I have a super special guest to introduce you here today. Her name is Jane Westman. Jane is a dear friend as well as colleague. We spend a lot of time together in the New York business world and networking world. Jane is president of Jane Westman Public Relations, which is a marketing firm that works with book publishers, writers, and business thought leaders. She is the author of Dive Right In, The Sharks Won't Bite on Women and Entrepreneurship, and her articles about entrepreneurship have been published in such popular media outlets as Entrepreneur and Inc., Jane is an advisor to nonprofit organizations and business startups. She served as the president of the New York City chapter of the National Association of Women Business Owners, also known as NABO, for four years and has been an active board member of many other professional organizations, including the Women's Media Group and the Publishers Publicity Association. Jane is based in New York City and is one of the most avid art collectors yeah. on the New York scene. Welcome, Jane. <laughs> Uh, Deb, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. And people who are interested in contemporary art should follow you on Instagram to see your feed of the various artists that you go around and meet and, and what you're collecting. Uh, it's really fascinating to watch you. So aside from being a wonderful entrepreneur who has scaled up a fabulous business and is the go-to for anyone publishing a business-oriented book in New York City or anywhere in the country, actually. She also has a very personal side, which is very interesting. So I wanted to share that, Jane. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So today we're talking about three mistakes that new entrepreneurs make when they're first starting out. And most of the time you and I agree, and sometimes we have different perspectives, so this should be fun. So Jane, based on your experience, and you've been doing this a while, and you wrote uh, dive right in, the sharks won't bite, what, 25 years ago? Yes, uh, I believe June 6th, 2020 will be the 25th anniversary of the publication of the book. And uh, we're, we're going to throw a bit of a celebration with um, a lot of, let's say, Throwback Thursday articles that can be reached via Twitter and LinkedIn. I'll be sending out some emails so, you, so you'll hear more about what we're going to be doing to celebrate the 25th anniversary of my book. Oh, wonderful. And check out the show notes. We'll put links to follow Jane on Twitter and Instagram and various other channels there as well. So Jane, you've uh, seen a lot, right? So you've seen a lot of uh, people start businesses. And typically, I work with women business owners. I know you wrote the book, Dive Right In, focused on women business owners. So tell us about what are the, the biggest mistakes that you see new entrepreneurs make? Well, I, I think... Um one of the biggest mistakes is, is this myth about finding your passion, that if you're passionate about starting a business, if you have a passion for something, then go full force and there will be a market for you. And I, I call that inside out thinking. That doesn't work. You need outside in. You need to create a business that other people will be passionate about. That doesn't mean I'm saying you should create a business you don't like or uh, create a business um, in some field that you're not interested in. But what I'm saying is don't simply be led by your own passion. Make sure that there's actually a market out there for people who will be passionate about buying from you. So just because you have a big idea you're passionate about doesn't mean you have a business. So, Absolutely. So what's the right way? What's the outside in approach? What recommendations do you have for our listeners today who are aspiring entrepreneurs and they have a big idea they're passionate about? What's the next thing they should do? 
Well, I, I think when we're talking uh, about people who are leaving the corporate environment to, to go out on their own, often they're going to go into fields that are connected to the business where they were already working. And so that means they must have a lot of contacts and leads and people that they know. And I think that when you're ready to start a business, you need to just go out there and get yourself some clients, get some customers. That way you're going to know right off the bat whether or not somebody will buy your product or your services. It's, it's pretty simple. Yeah, you don't have a business if you don't have a client, right? And a lot of women entrepreneurs do the website, they get their logo done, they're all focused on getting their branding in place. And meanwhile, sometimes it's months or years, and they don't have a client yet. Well, you know, one of the one of the most successful women entrepreneurs that I've done business with, she runs um, a $10 million company. And I said to her, tell me about starting your business, which was about 10 years ago. What did you do? She said, you know what? I went out and I found a client. I wanted to make sure I had a viable business. It was that simple for her. And when I've asked other women entrepreneurs, what do you do when you start a business? Almost all of them told me they went out and they found a customer. And I think spending too much time building your website or coming up with the right name for your business is really just a form of of either we could call perfectionism or procrastination that isn't going to get you anywhere if this vision that you have for a business is not viable. Absolutely. And we kind of covered that in episode number three called Fake Progress. Right? It's doing the right things, but at the wrong time. So, Jane, I know you didn't jump from the corporate world, I don't believe. Is that true? Uh, no, I did jump from the corporate world. Oh, you world. did? So what's yeah, your yeah. personal story? How did you get started in Jane Westman PR? So um, I was the publicity director of um, a major book publisher. I was downsized, surprise, (laughs) (laughs) you know, (laughs) my favorite word. I lost my job. And but I had been uh, a book publicity or book marketing expert for about 10 years by then. And I did know a lot of people in book publishing and I knew there was a need for the services that I could provide. And so I went out and started a business. The first day that I was in business, I had three clients. And that's also a way that I funded my business, which we could perhaps talk about in another episode. But in those days, it was decades ago, there were no websites. I had a business card. But what I did was I called, uh, wrote to, contacted all the people that I knew who I thought might want me to market books for them. And I opened my doors with my three clients, all of whom paid me the first month's retainer fee right then when I started my business. So I was able to use that money to pay my first month's expenses. That's wonderful. You know, self-funding is the route that most entrepreneurs take, especially in the services sector. And so uh, what I love about the story that you just told and what I know about you personally and some advice that you gave me a few years ago when uh, I was really struggling with getting the numbers that I wanted to get is uh, you're very frank about, you know, you got to get your hustle on. Yes, absolutely. By the way, I just want to step back about self-funding. I don't consider getting my clients to pay me Uh, at the start of every month, self-funding, I use their money, not my money. That's a great point. And and that's a great way when you're in a service business to get going is, is to think about going out there and getting that startup capital by um, signing up your clients and getting them to pay you, especially if you're being paid month by month. I think we're going to get a talk about how to bill for your services in in a minute. But that's a very good way to do it. You get your clients, they pay you month by month at the start of each 30-day cycle. And that way you're not burning through your savings, you're not putting your future at risk, you're you're completely funded through your new business on day one. That's Yeah, and in those days I, I had maybe you know, it's hard to remember, but either it was $500 or maybe if I was lucky, 5000 I have a feeling it was more like I had about $500 in, 
I wasn't going to start a business on $500. So that's why I got the capital. But don't forget, I already was an expert in the field. So, and that's, the advantage of women who are leaving the corporate structure and want to start businesses. If you're going to start a business in the field where you are already an expert, you really have a good chance of making a go of it. That's a great point. And there's also a lot of women who are listening to this podcast who have gone for a new degree or new certification. So perhaps they're a leadership coach or executive coach. And I think the point that you just brought up still applies because I know for me, when I launched my coaching practice, I was doing some consulting on the side, which was the market research work that I was doing for the company I was working for, helping other companies with some product development, uh, new service development work. But then I was coaching, and my first clients were my former peers. Exactly. So these people knew that you had the expertise or the ability to help them. And that's how you test your market idea is you go out there and you sell it. It's not a market test when you go out and you ask people, hey, would you buy this product or service if it's available? That's not a market test because anybody could say, yeah, sounds cool. Sounds great. Yeah, I would buy it. A real market test is getting someone to pay for it. So, Jane, you know, I frequently talk to my clients about finding the gap as the market test. You know, what's the problem that isn't being solved or isn't being solved well that you can fill uniquely with your expertise and really carve out that unique market position in the market? And so for you, what was the gap that you filled? What was the gap that you saw when you launched your business? At the time that I launched my business, there were very few people who were consultants in book publicity and book marketing. At that time, all of that work was being done in-house within uh, book publishing companies. And all of those departments were overwhelmed and overburdened so that a publicity department in a publishing company couldn't do in-depth publicity on each book. And I knew that because... I had been running a publicity department like that, and we were always, you know, running as fast as we could to catch up. And there was tremendous demand from the authors of the books saying, hey, you know, why aren't you doing more for me? So I knew there was a huge need out there because I was experiencing it myself from running a, a publicity department. As soon as I went out looking for business, there was a lot of business available. And that's what you want, right? So when you start a business, you want to identify a need that people have in the marketplace that's not being satisfied very well or an itch that's not being scratched and uh, figure out a service offering around that. So especially uh, if it's a crowded market. Now, you emerged at a time when you saw a need. There weren't a lot of book publicity people out there, and you fill that gap. And that's a beautiful thing. And it, to the extent that people can do that, that's the best strategy for you when you launch a business. I mean, it's the same thing with me at the Launch Lab. What I noticed was when women were launching businesses, no one was was saying that the things that you and I are talking about, like how to test your big idea, uh, what to do in the right order, how to get a client first, and how to balance the inspiration with the street hustle and actually get your message out there and, and start working with people. But, you know, even today, when there are lots of people who do book marketing, the marketplace has grown. And so if I were to start a business now, I would, in book marketing, I would look to see where are the weaknesses, where are there not enough people filling the gaps. So it, it's the same thing, whether it's a crowded marketplace or a marketplace that I entered into with, with very little competition. But it still meant that I had to convince people that they should use this newfangled service that I was providing. I do want to take one step back because I say go out there and find a client or, or sell your product. In order to do that, you need to be extremely articulate about what your product or service is. So perhaps we should take a step back and say the first thing is to have a very clear vision 
of what it is you're selling and be able to articulate that vision to your prospective clients. So that's the first thing you need to do. And yes, you should have some type of a, of a web presence, uh, a business card, but it doesn't have to be total perfection. It just needs to be good enough to be able to get out there and test the market and try to get some sales because you can always improve your, your website, uh, change your business card, but you don't, don't keep procrastinating because it has to be perfect. It has to be perfect. Get something up there that has a clear vision, a clear marketing message and go out there and sell. That's great advice. Great advice. It doesn't need to be perfect. Done is better than perfect. And when you're first starting out, there'll be iterations on your message. You know, you don't want to be the blah, 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 blah at the networking event and everyone's eyes are glazing over uh, because they don't understand what, <laughs> what you've just said. So spending time on your message is great advice. So let's talk about the money. So another place that women really struggle especially in services businesses, is when it comes to pricing their services. And you and I were together in a networking event, and you told a great story that illustrated what's wrong with pricing. So can you, can you share that story and, and share with us uh, your best practices for how do you price your services? Yes, ab- absolutely. So it's very tempting, particularly in the service business, to want to bill by the hour and to t- you try to figure out how much you want to make per hour or what you think your services are worth per hour. I strongly recommend that you do not bill by the hour. And one way to think about it is, is to think more on, on in terms of monthly. You know, your expenses are monthly. Your landlord or your mortgage company isn't billing you by the hour. They're billing you by the month. Your um, phone bill, your internet connection, the lease on your car or the loan on your car, these are all monthly payments. And so I think it's better to be looking at when you're pricing your services, to be looking um, at how much money you need to make per month or maybe break it down per week, but don't go into smaller units than that. So that said, when you bill by the hour, what happens is your client is counting the minutes and in his or her head is going, oh, this 10 minutes just cost me $50 or, or whatever. And you don't want them thinking like that. You want them thinking of, you know, what are the results am I getting? What's the overall, you know, service that I'm getting here? And my example is, this really came home to me recently when um, a prospective client didn't want to work on a, a long-term project uh, on a monthly for me to bill monthly. And he wanted me to bill him by the hour. So I said, okay, it'll be $500 an hour. It's going to take us five hours to get this done. So that'll be about $2,500. Fair price for the work that I needed to do for him was $2,500 an hour. Um, So we started the consulting and Every time I I had one hour consultation with him, he condensed it into half an hour. And for each time I had to speak with him, I had to prepare probably half an hour in order to be ready to speak with him. So already, you know, my half hour session was really an hour, but I could only bill him for half an hour. And he was very aware that every single thing I said to him was costing him money you know, per minute, whatever. <laughs> so, so, if, and $500 an hour sounds like a pretty hefty fee, would to me. So after an hour and a half, he just, you know, three phone calls, three half hour phone calls were done. He decided, you know, that's enough. I don't need any more consulting. Well, I didn't really get to finish the whole package with him, which would have been $2,500. But in his head, he just couldn't, he just couldn't wrap his mind around $500 an hour. So the next person who came along, who also wanted some consulting as opposed to a big package, asked me what my fee would be. And I said, um, it'll be $2,500. 
And I didn't break it down into hours because I knew that it would take me about five hours to get this project done for him. And so he said, great. I got paid my $2,500 for the whole project. I ended up only working four hours. So I actually made more money per hour. My client was really happy because of the results he got, but, and he never had to think about how many minutes I was spending doing this work for him. I love that story. And it's so illustrative of, you know, if you charge by the hour, people evaluate you by the hour as opposed to by the journey that you're taking together, by the experience that they will get, the things they'll be able to do once your project is through. So I'm a big fan of pricing based on the outcome, not based on the hour. And also, you know, if you're a solopreneur, if you're running your business on your own, you'll gradually, you'll eventually run out of time and also cap off uh, your ability to earn an income. You cap off your revenue uh, if it's based on time. So I know you and I have different approaches to scaling a business, but let's talk a little bit about how you scaled Westman Public Relations and what you recommend for new entrepreneurs starting out to set themselves up to be able to scale. Because we're in this, because there's no limit on what you can earn. This is, in my mind, the new feminist movement. And if you're going to meet your revenue goals, whether those that's six figures, seven figures or more, you have to set yourself up to scale. So what's your advice? You can't do it alone. (laughs) <laughs> That's my number one rule. You cannot succeed on your own. You cannot scale on your own. You need help. And so in the days when I started my business, before all the technology that brings us together, email, the internet, Zoom meetings, you know, go-to meeting, everything that we use, all, all of the tools for collaboration that exist, all the, the technology tools for collaboration that exist, I had to hire employees to get work done. So I could not use consultants, which I think you can use more of today. But I, um, I started within a couple of weeks. I hired somebody to come and work for me. And um, I, it's funny, I paid her by the hour, <laughs> 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 which was good for me at that time. <laughs> but remember, she could only make as much money as, hours there were in the day for her to work. But I started very quickly bringing somebody on board because I could go out and sign up more business than than I could possibly do myself. So I quickly brought people on board. What I'm suggesting today is because of technology, you can use virtual assistants to help. You can use consultants to help. But underneath it all, I'm a big believer in employees. I'm a big believer in at least starting with one employee because this person becomes a knowledge base for you. This person works only for you, gets to understand your business, becomes a big source of information because he or she is going to know so much about what's going on and will become invaluable to you. And so I suggest biting the bullet and getting someone to come and work for you. And if you need to have the person start part-time, that's fine. But just realize that by having people who are working with you and only you and who are loyal to you, this allows you to scale your business. It's really tough to do. It seems really difficult to have to commit to someone to pay that person's a paycheck to cover their unemployment insurance and social security and all these payroll taxes that that we have to pay. But in the long run, if you, it works, if you have a vision of building a business, you need help, you need loyalty. And this also means you're going to have to learn to be a good leader, a good entrepreneurial leader. And yeah, it's scary when you you think about hiring your first employee full time because you're suddenly responsible for someone else's livelihood. And it really puts the pressure on to get the cash flow moving. So what did you what did you delegate? You know, sometimes just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. And 
when you're first starting out, there are some key things that you should delegate. So in your case, Jane, when you brought that first employee on, what did you delegate to them? And then what did you focus on as the CEO? Yeah. Okay. So I delegated actual publicity work. So the people that I brought on were what we call book publicists. In other other words, the first person who worked for me part-time, and I point that out, you can bring on somebody part-time if full-time is too stressful. And you can also start with a a consultant working for you. But I'm just saying, have the vision, the long-term vision that you're going to develop a team of really loyal people working for you. So I hired a person who could carry out the work that we were doing uh, that I had promised my clients that I would do. So I was creating this overall strategy. I was being the mastermind, but I needed somebody who could carry out the work. So in my case, in those days, it meant often making lots and lots of phone calls to uh, journalists to tell them about the books that we were publicizing, to try to get like a book reviewer at the New York Times to review the book or try to get a producer at the Today Show to arrange for our client to be interviewed on, on television. On top of that, there was clerical work that had to be done. This is so long ago, Deb, but I'm thinking about it. I used to do a lot of this myself. We used to have to do a lot of mailing, send out paper press releases and and do a lot of mailing. So the person who came on board just helped me do a little bit of everything. But what I did, what I always did, and what nobody else was able to do for me for a very long time was sales. I was always selling I was always out there looking for new business. I was always creating the strategy of how to market our company, how to fulfill that marketing, and how to turn that marketing into set, into new clients. As a new CEO, you are sales, you are marketing, your HR, your admin, uh, your finance, you play all the roles. And if you're not selling, then you're not serving. So as a CEO, if you don't like to sell or if you don't like marketing, you either have to get over it, hire someone else to do it, or get a job. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I would say... If you really want to be an entrepreneur, you better get over it. <laughs> because even uh, when, I, when I think about all the, the women entrepreneurs who have become successful, even the ones who didn't like to deal with the money part, who, who hated collecting money or cash flow, you could always hire someone to help you, you know, an accountant, a bookkeeper, a virtual CFO. You can do that part. But when it comes to explaining what you do, what services you provide and selling, it's up to it's up to the entrepreneur. It's up to you, the CEO. You cannot delegate that, at least not in the beginning, not until you have a big enough business that can be scaled and then you can have salespeople. Right, because when you're in your line of work or you're a coach or a consultant, uh, people are buying you and they need to see you. I know when I hire a coach, one of the things I ask, because many of the coaches I work with are six-figure earners, multiple six-figure earners, because that's where I'm going in my career. I want someone who's already been there and done that. But I also want to make sure that I get to spend time with that coach, that I'm not being handed off to someone on her team or someone who has worked with her before. So it becomes important as a consultant, as a coach, even as you scale to six figures or multiple six figures, that there is a way for your clients to still get a get you. And sometimes leverage in your business might mean that instead of working with people one-on-one, it might mean that you're working one-to-many. I'm, we'll talk in future episodes of different ways you can scale your business. In Jane's case, hiring people was the best strategy. And that's how she built up a multi-million dollar business. So, and this is what you need to do too. So Jane, any, any other thoughts on, on scaling? Well, I, I I think it's interesting what you were saying is that a six figure coach is probably going to have other coaches working for her. I, or I would assume, you know, that's what I did. I had other book 
publicist working for me. So part of my sales process was making sure that my prospective client was comfortable working with me and my team. And that's what what you were talking about, Deb. You were saying, you know, you need to coach too many and and then perhaps you know your your individual clients can also work with other people on your team so you might be checking in with your clients like once a month you know to make sure everything is going well or just to have a review or maybe it's once a quarter so i work with some financial consultants as well and and they have bookkeepers and other people who work on their team and once a quarter or twice a year or once a month depending on the service package that people have purchased that that the retainer package that they're they're working under then that dictates how much of me you get one on one yeah but i but what i think the key is is customer satisfaction and the way that customers who are buying a service from you are satisfied is if they know that you know everything that's going on and that you are aware of what's happening and that you're going to troubleshoot if there are any issues so i think keeping an open line of communication with all of your clients is essential. Even if you have other people who are servicing them on a day-to-day basis, it's this sense of comfort that your client has that he or she knows that you're there for them and that you are actually overseeing the project. Great advice. Keep in touch with your clients even when you are outsourcing, well, not outsourcing, but delegating the majority of the service delivery to your people. Uh, So we talked about three things. We talked about how to fill a gap in the market and get a client and have your first clients fund your new startup. We talked about pricing based on outcome and value, not by the hour, because you'll run out of time before you uh, make enough money. And then lastly, positioning yourself to scale by bringing on other people to support you and delegating certain tasks so that you can be the front front face of your business. You can be selling, you can be out there having conversations with people, being seen and heard and marketing the business and drumming up interest with new and prospective clients. So Jane, uh, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. We just had a little disconnection in our call, so we hopped back on. And Jane, you just said something that is one of the reasons why I really appreciate you. You want to repeat that? Um, We have so many experiences in starting our businesses that are so different, and yet we share so much that is the same. And it's the same because business is the same. It doesn't matter if you're running a physical PR firm or if you're running a coaching practice or an accelerator and doing business online. The basic principles of business still apply You need to go out there, you need to get a client, you need to price your services appropriately, and you need to position yourself to scale and focus on those numbers, ladies. Focus on those numbers. Numbers are your friend. And if you enjoyed this episode of Life After Corporate, please subscribe and leave us a review. We'd love to hear from you. Every week, we offer great advice and tips and experts who can help you launch and grow your business so that you can meet your financial and lifestyle goals. And if you're not already a member, please hop over to the Life After Corporate Facebook group. It's there where you will get additional insight and tools and training to help you move your business forward. Plus, it's a rock and fabulous community of women. Talk to you soon, everyone. That's it for now. Thanks for listening, my friend. If you enjoyed this show, please head over to iTunes and subscribe and leave us a review. And be sure to hop over to the Life After Corporate Facebook group and join other growing entrepreneurs to get weekly tips on how to create more money and meaning doing work you love.